Due to the massive success of Kirby's Dream Land, HAL Laboratory immediately began working on bringing Kirby to the color screen, which naturally became one of the first obstacles. What color do they make him? There was a lot of dissension among different localization teams. You see, when the American team designed the box art for Kirby's Dream Land, they did so having only seen him on the black and white Game Boy screen. And since, well, Kirby isn't black, they made him white. And still, there were some people who wanted to make him yellow, but in the end they decided to go with pink in order to match the original Japanese promotional material. You can still see Kirby in all kinds of different colors in games like Super Smash Bros. and The Amazing Mirror, but this was the game that defined his default color as pink. Kirby's adventure is to Kirby's Dreamland what Twisted Metal 2 was to Twisted Metal. The first game tested the waters of the new IP and grew the franchise's popularity, which then absolutely exploded in the sequel. Kirby's Adventure is a massive game. People complained about the short length of the first game, but the sequel actually pushed the limits of what the system was capable of. This was one of the later era NES games. The graphics in it are spectacular, with lots of background details and even some rudimentary parallax scrolling. But as an unfortunate side effect, the game is also incredibly laggy with a relatively low frame rate, since there are about seven levels of graphical compression just to fit everything in the cartridge, which was already the single largest game to be released on the American NES, and second largest worldwide thanks to another HAL game, Metal Slater Glory, which was their last independent game before being officially bought out by Nintendo. Kirby was back with a vengeance and with a huge new world to explore. And when I say this game is huge, believe me, the first game contained only four levels, not counting the boss rush in the final stage. But Kirby's Adventure contained as much content as seven Dreamlands. Every level contains multiple stages, each one about as long as the level from the first game. So you can do the math right there. In fact, the final level in this game is essentially a compressed version of the entirety of Kirby's Dreamland. Just reminding you how far we've come in a single game. It would have been enough to just give you each of the levels in a linear fashion, but HAL decided to go one step further and give you a whole world map to explore, filled with mini-games where you could win extra lives, museums where you could find power-ups if you didn't have one, and even secret areas that you have to unlock by finding switches within levels. I always loved the Quick Draw minigame, which I think is the closest we ever get to actually seeing Kirby use a gun. I guess it's a good thing he never did. I mean, when you can turn into a giant rock golem and trample everything, just using a handgun seems awfully lazy. The game was also responsible for introducing us to one of the coolest bosses in any Kirby game, Mr. Shine and Mr. Bright. I don't know what it is, but I love these guys. The tag team combat, the way they each have their own unique methods of attack, whether on the ground or in the sky, they just have so much variety. There were other bosses introduced here as well, like Paint Roller, whose attack method would later be reused for characters like Edo and Drossia. And of course, Meta Knight, who would go on to become possibly an even more famous antagonist than King DDD himself. Speaking of whom, the story of Kirby's Adventure is a bit more creative than Dreamland. The Star Rod, power source of the Fountain of Dreams, has been stolen by King Dedede, who broke it into seven pieces and gave one to each of his friends. Without the fountain, the people of Dreamland can't dream, which kind of sucks when you live in a place called Dreamland. And it's causing them to become restless and sick. So apparently they're like bonkers in that regard. Upon rebuilding the Star Rod, you discover the real threat, an ominous entity known as the Nightmare Wizard. Turns out DDD didn't destroy the Star Rod to be evil, but did so to prevent the Nightmare from acquiring it. It's actually a pretty good character moment, showing that King DDD isn't evil, just misunderstood. Undoubtedly, the most notable feature of this game is Kirby's new copy ability. Now, instead of simply destroying enemies when he swallowed them, Kirby would actually be able to absorb their powers and use them against others. For the first game to really have them, Kirby's powers are an eclectic variety. All the power-ups you'd expect to see are here, like Sword, Parasol, Beam, and Cutter. Every power you received had only one way of using it, except in a few cases where attacks had minor variants. If you had the Fire ability, you would press the attack button to breathe fire. If you had Fireball, pressing attack would cause you to dash forward as a fireball. But then you start to get a sense that the designers were kind of running out of ideas near the end, with power-ups like the High Jump, or Ball, or Throw. Seriously, when I first played this game, I thought it was broken. I'd press the button and see Kirby inhale, and just not understand why it wasn't doing something cool. What would you expect? I was 8. There were some other new features for this game as well, which became common for the series, like Kirby's slide attack, similar to Mega Man, and the water gun, which finally gave Kirby a method of defending himself underwater, even when he didn't have a power-up. They also realized that even with all the special powers Kirby could have, they still had to make sure his inhale ability was worth using. So they actually made it one of the most powerful attacks in the game, often dealing several times as much damage to bosses as using a power would. 
There were times when I would deliberately drop a power when facing a boss just because spitting the star at him is so much stronger. While I do like the wide variety of powers in this game, it seems like this resulted in a lot of redundancy. Needle and Spark, for example, can pretty much be used interchangeably for one another, as they both hit the same area of effect around Kirby. Which in turn is the same area of effect as Freeze, but without the ability to make ice blocks. Talk it up to experimentation, I guess. And now for a segment I like to call the best and worst powers of the game. I didn't do this in the last episode because, well, there weren't really any powers in that one. This is going to be mostly a matter of personal preference, but best refers to most useful or fun, and worst refers to most underpowered or useless. For the best weapon, the obvious answer here is UFO, but that's sort of cheating because it's designed to be overpowered and rare. A lot of power-ups are really useful, so nothing really stands out, but I think I'm going to go with Cutter. It's got good range and speed, keeping you far away from danger. But it's a really close call. There's a lot of other fun weapons. Parasol, rock, wheel... Damn! As for the worst power-up, again, sleep would be cheating, so I'm going to go with Needle. The range is just so uselessly short, and it doesn't even attack enemies that are below it. For me, this is where the series really got started. It was the first time we saw Kirby as we know him today, the pink puffball with the ability to absorb powers from his enemies. Hal was trying things out and seeing what worked and what didn't. With two games firmly under their belt, the stage was set for a return to the game board. But first, Kirby had to take a little detour in a strange new land. 